Hey, welcome to Colby's Corner. Today we are going to continue our exploring and go to the New York Town and Francis by the Force. Stay tuned. This is called the CIC. You know what CIC stands for? No, sir. It's the Combat Information Center. This is the brains of the carrier right here. This is where everything took place. They would check radar. They would have a chart here. This was before computers. And they would mark all where the aircraft was on here. And you'd have a guy that was directing different operations on the ship, whether it was stuff going on on the flight deck or or it was um, uh, checking the radar for other ships in the area and all of that. And it, you had this place was full of people. And we have a few uh, mannequins here to kind of give you an idea. But if you can think about it, this whole room would be just full of people. You notice the lights are red. Yeah. When they were under, when they were, they would leave the lights red because uh, if they walked up on the flight deck. It would be easier for their eyes to get adjusted in the dark. That's what those red lights are for. Yeah, it does seem dark in here. Yeah, it sure does. This is the steering wheel. You can look How at... How could you see that though? You didn't have to. You see, it was, there was people, there was instruments here that would show you what direction the ship mm. was going, how fast it was going. Uh, can I spin it? Yeah, you can spin it. This is how you turn the ship. It, now, you, it, it's not hooked up anymore, but this yeah. is how they controlled the ship. There would be one sailor right here, and the captain would be somewhere in here, and he would be saying, okay, turn the ship 20 degrees this way or 20 degrees that way. And they would look right here, and it would tell how many and how fast it was going, how many revolutions that the motors were turning, and that would all be controlled right from here. Now it's all done with computers today. Now back then it was all gauges and, and tubes and wires. Dude, it still moves. Yeah, see now when they got ready to like speed up, this would it be going full. It would they would say, okay, I want to go full speed and, and there would be an indicator just like this down in the engine room. And then you see where that little white arrow is? That uh, white arrow would drop down and on top of that one, and that way the captain knew that the people downstairs knew his order. Right here, you want to sit up in this a minute? Sure. Now, when the captain, when the ship was coming into a dock, he was getting ready to dock the ship, he would come out here and sit. This was what they call the captain's docking bridge. And he could still give orders to the people out there and he would stand here and he had his gauges there just like inside and then he would be there to see oversee the ship getting next put in dock so when the this is a big ship and he was able to look out here because it always usually would be docked on the same side as the captain's docking bridge and he could look behind them and he could look in front of them because you can spin it that's right and he could see where he needed to uh where he needed to dock the ship like she's at a dock now but he would be right in here and he would be giving orders to the men to make sure that they went ahead and did what he said. Okay? Now see, when the captain wasn't docking the ship, he would be sitting right here. And you know, can you, can you notice what he can see? What can he see? He can see the airplanes launch. That's right, that's exactly right. He can see the airplanes launch and then he could look over and see which way the ship's going and he could look backwards and to the left and can look to the right and look ahead and he could this window these windows would be open and he can yell his orders or are they open right now or yeah they see it's glass? right it's open right there and he could look right in where the where the sailor would be steering the ship and he could say uh, hard left rudder or, or turn right or whatever and he would he would be able to watch that from here so he had a re he had the best view on the ship to look at anything. And this is where the captain sat? This is where the captain sat, exactly. This is where the cap see, it's the captain's chair. And he can monitor and, and look at everything that's going on. And he had a he had phones here that he could talk to different people. Yeah, right here. Uh-huh. He sure could. 
Oh, hey guys, how you doing today? Well, it's Painter Pete here again. You know, it's really cool seeing Colby back out there at the Yorktown. You know, that is one really big ship. And you know, speaking of ships, what do you think about my model ship here? Hey, this is pretty cool, huh? Getting some blue on it, some little bit of red, there's some yellow up here. It looks good. I mean, hey, it's Painter Pete. I gotta paint my ship, right? So, did you know that the Bible actually talks about a ship and its rudder? Do you know what the rudder is? Well, before we get to the rudder, remember seeing Colby turn that big wheel up there on the, on the Yorktown? Well, that wheel that he was turning actually controls the rudder. What's the rudder? Well, let me show you on this ship here. The rudder is this yellow part right there. Do you see that yellow? That is the rudder. And this rudder actually steers or helps steers the ship where it's going. So this itty bitty little rudder steers this big ship. And you know, Yorktown has one just like that. Did you know that the Bible talks about that rudder? That's right, the Bible does. Here, let's here, let me show it to you. All right, here we go. It's in. All right, it's in James 3, verses 4 and 5. And it says, It is the same with ships. A ship is very big and it is pushed by strong winds, but a very small rudder controls that big ship. And the one who controls the rudder decides where the ship will go. It goes where he wants it to go. It is the same with our tongue. It is a small part of the body, but it can boast about doing great things. See, that scripture is talking about how the rudder controls the ship. It also talks about our tongue. You know, this thing right here, this is our tongue. All right, it talks about our tongue, how it can boast. Well, boasting means it can brag, it can talk about, say bad things about people, it can say good things about people. All right, so we gotta be careful what our tongue says, because this little tongue can, can sometimes control where we're going. Have you ever been in trouble for talking back to your parents? Mm, yeah, that happens a lot sometimes. Have you ever told a lie? Yeah, that one little lie can blow out to something really big. That is all something coming right from your tongue. So you gotta learn to be able to control your tongue so those things don't happen. The, con the tongue can also do some really cool stuff. It can tell people good things. It can encourage people. You know, like, hey, you're out of the baseball field. Hey, bud, that was a really good hit that you did there. Or cheer them on, like you're cheering on your big fan. You know? Well, all right, well, I gotta get back to painting my model here. And uh, Colby's going out to a really cool place. He's going out to the Francis Feidler Forest. You know? So, better be careful, Colby. I hear there might be some gators out there. All right. All right. Got to get back to painting this. Hey, we're down here at Francis Feidler Forest, and today I have one with me, Tara Bailey. What do you do? Hi, Colby. I'm Tara Bailey, and I'm a naturalist here at the Francis Feidler Forest, and I... I love to take people here through the swamp and explain the inner workings of this beautiful ecosystem. So, can you tell me where we are right now? Yes, we are at the point of the swamp where the land begins to get a little bit lower. And if you look at these plants out here, do you know what these are? Mm, no, ma'am. These are dwarf palmettos, and they tell us that the elevation of the land is changing. And this is what makes it a swamp, the fact that this can be a flooded forest. Yeah. So we, we're not flooded right now. We're in our dry season, <laughs> right? Yes, ma'am. But when we have our springs and summers and there's a lot more rain, starting from about this area where you begin to see these dwarf palm meadows, it becomes a little bit more wet. And then that changes the whole ecosystem. And from wet up here just looks like regular woods, it's going to look like what you imagine a swamp will be. We'll see all kinds of more different animals and plant life. And what kind of animals live in the swamp? What kind of animals do you suspect live in a swamp? Mm. When you think of a swamp, what comes to your mind? Alligators. Alligators. Okay, well, that is one of the first things that people say when they hear swamp. And we do have some alligators, but not in this portion, because where would they be? There's nowhere yeah, there's for them no to place go. To hide. Right, but we have a lake at the end of this boardwalk, and it's been called a lake because there's enough depth in that water for an alligator to make good habitat. So it's deep and he can hide and he can swim and he can look for food and get away from other animals and so we do have an alligator there but it's not out here in the swamp area where people can walk around. What are like I know these are called cypress knees mm -hmm. but what are they really for? Well that's another good question because 
scientists still don't 100% know. We have some theories on these cypress knees. Uh, one theory is that it exchanges gases with the air, which of course feeds the tree. And what, what theory do you believe that's true? Well, the, another theory is that it stabilizes the cypress that's trees. That's what I thought is. Yes, during an event like a hurricane or even yeah. just a really harsh storm. And look at all these knees out mm -hmm. in the land. Well, and the trees that you're primarily looking at right now are tupelo trees, but Isn't we that have a cypress. A, that's a tupelo tree. They oh. both have these buttress bottoms, and so they look very similar. But this is a blackwater cypress tupelo swamp. So we have lots of cypress trees and lots of tupelo trees out here. Yeah. I'll show you a cypress tree. Cypress trees. Oh. See the bark of these to tupelo like, trees? They go to yeah. like. Look at this. Look at this bark right here. Cypress trees are more smooth and they're more cylindrical and they're aren't they they're wider? Yeah. Well, yes, they are. They're the dominant like species of tree here. out here. Well, let's go up here and look at one. Oh. Listen to this tree. Sounds hollow. It's hollow on the inside. The way you can you can tell with the vibration in your mm -hmm. head. How do you think it remains alive if it's hollow? I'm not sure. Well, there is a substance inside these trees, a tissue called cambium. And when trees are young, it's more solid. So if you were to chop a tree in half when it's young, it would be nice and thick and solid on the inside, right? Yes, ma'am. But as a tree ages, the cambium thins out. It spreads out. And remember, this tree on How average is, is about, this tree? about a thousand years old. And so it's pretty old, so this, the layer of cambium beneath this bark is very thin, but it is still alive. As long as it's connected to the root system, and is still alive, this tree can continue living. How, have you ever like a fallen tree, like like one that fell but you could still see its uh, trunk? The inside? No, the trunk. Yeah, the when trunk. It, can, have you ever like counted how old it was? I have not personally done that. We have some uh, arborists who can Take come and, and do that type of it. thing. Right, <laughs> uh, but I can show you what the inside of one of these looks like if we sure. walk. A hollow tree because we have one that was a dead tree and it was in danger of, of falling onto the boardwalk and so they had to have some people come and cut it down but again they let it, the tree remain just dead on the ground but you can see the stump where they had to cut it now you can see how this tree was obviously cut down right yeah a lot of those other trees are smoothed out I mean are, are real rough at the top this is smoothed out so it's pretty even. So they cut this tree and it fell in that direction and we're leaving it there to decompose. And this actually provides good habitat yeah. for animals. There were some fawns that dinned in there a few springs What's ago. What's a fawn? A baby deer. Oh, yeah. And there were two of them. There were a pair who used this as their habitat. But this is what uh, a hollow tree looks like if you are to cut one down. See all this cambium? This is dead cambium. Nice, live, healthy cambium would be that nice, pretty orange color. But this isn't solid anymore, it's thinned out. Yeah. Right? And so, um, as long as it's still healthy and alive, it can continue living. But this one just died of natural causes, just old age. And so, they had to eliminate it because if it had fallen, where could it have fallen? It could have fallen on this boardwalk and hurt some people. So we but, had to make sure it didn't happen. Now, we have our snake sign here because in the warmer months we have a lot of snakes in this particular area and these are our most common snakes and Derek has been with me out here before we've seen some of these we've seen several of these why might this be a great spot for uh, snake sightings because there's a lot of water yeah there's a lot of water typically speaking there is water, and notice these are a lot of water snakes here. Yeah. Okay, the, the rat snake is not a water snake, but they can swim, and the cottonmouth obviously can swim, and these other water snakes, they swim under the water, and when they swim under the water, they're doing that to get away from predators or to go from spot to spot undetected. And, you know, oftentimes, like the brown water snake, it eats lots of fish, but the cottonmouth, it typically eats like all kinds of prey. Is only been right. In this one. right, the cottonmouth will swim on top of the water as opposed to underneath yeah. the water. It's not trying to hide so much. You can so see much. that one. So you though. can see them. And its head is shaped very differently 
from the non-venomous snakes. So the cottonmouth head is shaped in a definite spade shape, definite triangular shape. And the others are more rounded, kind of like the shape of your thumb. But the cottonmouth, it mm -hmm. preys on everything. It eats frogs, it can eat rodents, it can birds. eat other snakes. Yes, it can eat birds. It really is a, is, uh, a predatory animal that can eat a lot of different uh, species of animal. All right, let's get out here and see if we see any alligators. And you're going to see a lot of uh, logs and things in the water that might make you think you're seeing an alligator. Now, this isn't a lake like Lake Moultrie or anything, but we call this a lake because even when the rest of the swamp is dry, this is always wet. Last time I was out here with Derek, we were in canoes. We're out in a different lake, which is much bigger than this, so it has yeah, room for lots lakes of them. Here. We have several, but only one that visitors can really access. You can access the other one through the canoe trail, and that's a couple miles down the road. It actually ends up around here, but that lake is bigger, and it has a lot more alligators. And we There's could what? canoe towards the alligators, and guess what they do? What? Go There's underwater and swim away. Right, because they don't really want anything to do with us. You said you only have one alligator in this one, one in this lake. One, well, sometimes we've seen two. Hey, are you a kid and want to ask Colby a question? Well, ask your parents first, then email him at askcolby at wlcn.tv. Now, let's join Colby back at the USS Yorktown. But this is the flight deck. And... You know, you were asking about where the elevators were. Yes, when you, sir. When you came up on the ship initially, that was one elevator. And you see where that yellow line is right underneath that, that uh, this aircraft here? Yes, That's sir. another elevator. And we're going to go forward, and I'll show you where the one elevator is. That's, there's three elevators on this ship. Oh, you can't even see the puddles when it's oh, a puddle. Oh, yeah, it's been raining <laughs> today. Now... After World War II, they put something called catapults on the ship. You know what a catapult is? Yes, sir. Okay, it's like a big rubber band. Yeah, they, they would like shoot uh -huh. stuff on it. Well, we, there was two catapults on this ship, and you could see the little rail here, and I'll show you that up close. And they could shoot two planes off at the same time. How will it like catapult the planes off? Well, in the case of this see aircraft, you see those hooks would have a cable around it, and the, the, there's a motor in it that runs the catapult, and it would pull it all the way down off of that hook and pull it, pull it right down that rail there. Oh, and the jet so engine would be running, and then it would just pull it right on down there, and then it would they would just fly off. I was thinking of catapult, like you would, it would, you would pull it back, uh -huh. and you would put something in there, and you would fire. Oh, uh, there's <laughs> different ways to describe catapults, but this was the one that they used for the jet. So this wire would hook up on a hook here, behind that wheel, and this little piece here would go in between this tire, and it would push the aircraft right off the off the flight deck. So this would move, or the plane would move. This would move, it would move the plane. It would go right under here, and it would hook up under this little device here, and the plane would go right down the catapult. This right here is that, that other elevator right I was here. telling you about right here. And so when a plane was finished flying, and it would, they would roll it up here or roll it over there, and this would all drop. This and, was Elevator. Yeah, and then it would go back into the hangar, the hangar bay. Now this is the front of the ship. This is called the bow. This is the front of the ship. And this is the big tin. That we right? Uh huh. You got this so when the pilots flew over, they could look down and see the name because sometimes there might be more than one carrier in the in the fleet. So they would see this big number here, and that would let them know that, that this was the, the right one. That's right. This was the carrier they needed to land on. So if like they came down on this and let's say this one was 11 uh -huh. and they came down on it and they would see the 11 and they would just pull their plane right Yeah, they would pull up and come around and go find the other carrier. Sure would. And what is this one right here? Like what is that? Like it looks like what? a mouth. What is oh, that that's the for? air intake. Jets require a lot of air. So what happens is when they start the engine, 
air gets sucked into this. And then it hits that engine and it makes the turbine in the engine spin. And then they push fuel into that turbine. And as it spins faster and faster, it mixes with the air and that's what makes the flame come out of the back. Wow. Mm-hmm. And all jets have something like this. An air intake? Yep, they all have it. Now you see all the aircraft here on the Yorktown. Just imagine having 90 aircraft up here. Look how crowded it would be. Okay, this is called a 5-inch 38. There was four of them on this ship. And it was it's 38 feet long, and it had a 5-inch barrel on it. And this it would be about... 38 feet? 38 long this way. Now, you would have about 15 guys working on this. You'd have people coming in. You see that little elevator there? Yes. They would, the shells would come up way down below the ship, and they would carry them over here like this. And then they would come up, and then they had this little machine here, and they could adjust the fuse inside. Remember when I was telling you about that gun downstairs where it would they'd fire it off, and then it would blow up right before it by yes, the plane? That's the same thing in these, except the shells were a lot bigger. And then you had people that would sit in here, and they would look in these scopes here. What's that seat B? Well, that, that's one seat, but there used to be another one here. I guess this one doesn't have it, but you would... You would be right here, and they would take that shell, and they would load it right in here. This right here, it's called, this is what they call a breech. And they would slide that shell in here and close the breech. See? Yeah. They would close the breech, and then they would aim the gun and then fire it. Now, you got, now here, now you come over here. Here's a seat you can sit in. Be careful. Yeah. You come around. Okay. Uh. Now here's a seat. It's a little wet. It's like a bicycle seat. Yeah, exactly. It's like a bicycle seat. And you, uh, there would be a guy sitting in there. And he could he would look, see he would be a lot taller than you. Yeah. He would so be like, he would look up into that scope right there and he could aim the gun. It's all foggy. Yeah, it's pretty old. But he would sit there and it would be other people all around him helping him aim the gun. Jake is a greenish rat snake. Do you see the colors? Yeah. There's stripes there. He's a pretty guy. Yeah, it is pretty. And how does he feel? Touch it. Make sure you stroke. He's soft. Stroke her this way because her scales go in this direction. If you brush the other direction, it's, like it's a pretty uncomfortable. Hair. Right. Like a dog. And she's used to being handled by people, so that's mm -hmm. why she's pretty comfortable in this situation. But judging from her name, what can you tell me about her? Greenish rat snake. What uh, does she like to eat? Rats. Yeah, she'll eat rats and rodents. But she's mostly. so small. How does she eat them? Well, she can un unhinge her jaw, and what she does is she's a constrictor. What does huh? a constrictor mean? It, it, she squeezes her prey yeah. to kill it before she eats it, and then she swallows it whole. And I've seen her do it, but it's not huh. its not like us just taking one bite. She kind of yeah. has to work it in, and she kind of does her mouth like this to get, to get the mouth in. Um, and she only eats, we feed her about once a month. But these are a common species of snake for Bible Forest, and they're climbers. They like to climb trees. Is, Often she bite if I touch her head? Well, anything with a mouth can bite. She's not a venomous snake. Um, but, and she's never tried to bite you? me. No, I've never suffered a Jake bite. But Has she's ever tried to bite anyone? Um, I can't answer that. I don't know, but not to my knowledge, but she may have. But if you see a snake out in your yard or in the wild, what do you do? Uh, mostly um, go in the house. And right, that's what you should do is just leave it alone. There's no need to kill snakes if you see snakes in your yard because they pretty much just go on with their business. And uh, if you were to see one, it's probably not going to be there next time you come back.
Yeah. Unless it's nice and warm and sunny. There, I had a corn snake, which checkers is a corn snake. I had a corn snake in my yard a few years ago, and it just came out into the same step on my porch to catch sunshine. Sunshine. Can I hold her? Sure. Let me get her off of me. Now she's a, she loves to move around. That'd be very gentle. Just gently hold her, but make sure you hold her because oh, we can't let her go. Is. That's all right. <laughs> Where's she going? She is checking you out. Where's she That's going? It's okay. Around the back. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, her whole she's body a constrictor. Is she likes to uh, wrap herself around things and <laughs> squeeze them. Is that her head? That's her head. Hey, yeah, I'm still working on this model here. You know, I was thinking. Have you ever played the gossip game? Or it's also called maybe telephone, where you start a phrase and with one person, they start it, and then it goes around the circle to the last person, and the last person says what they, what they think they've heard. And you know how it always never sounds the same that it actually started up? It's kind of a fun game, but also tells you how rumors start, okay? When one person says one thing, and by the end it comes all the way back around, it's something completely different. You know, that reminds me of our scripture today. You know, it's found in James 3, verses 4 and 5. All right, here we go. All right, remember what it says this. It says, it is the same with ships. A ship is very big, and it is pushed by strong winds, but a very small rudder controls that big ship. And the one who controls the rudder decides where the ship will go. It goes where he wants it to go. It is the same with our tongue. It is a small part of the body, but it can boast about doing great things. A big forest fire can be started with only a little flame. All right, so let's look at that last part there. A big forest fire can be started by a little flame. You know, when we tell stories or gossip about people, our tongue or words can damage or injure that person, just like a fire can ruin a forest or like the swamp that Colby was out to today. You know, that little spark can start that huge forest fire, just like this little tongue right there can start a lot of rumors and hurt a lot of different people. You know, so let's take this time right now and say, you know what, I'm not going to talk bad about people. I'm not going to gossip about people. And you know what, let's use our tongue to take care of other people, just like we need to take the time to explore our world. You know, well, I hope you guys have enjoyed today being out with Colby, going to the U.S. Yorktown, going to Francis Wilder Forest. He's had a lot of fun doing a lot of exploring around this area. You know. I also want you to remember, don't forget to email us at askcolby at wlcn.tv. And remember, before you email us or get onto our Facebook page, you need to ask your parents permission first. Go to our Facebook page at facebook.com backslash Colby's Corner. Well, we've had a lot of fun today with Colby, and we've gone to some really cool places. So, but this is Painter Pete here, and i got to get back to painting my model. So I will see you next time right here on Colby's Corner.